Hey, this is Mike Kaju, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week's guests are Pat Estes and Aaron Davis of Train, Adapt, Evolve in Austin, Texas. These guys are two of the best strength and conditioning coaches that I know, and we actually go in a lot of different directions in this show. Uh, We talk about basic principles and fundamentals of strength and conditioning, which a lot of coaches nowadays are missing or have never even been taught because they're always trying to do uh, the new flashy training modality. Uh, Ironically, we also talk about a lot of the new technologies that these guys are using, like the Omega Wave, uh, PRI, and something called the Spyro Tiger. Um, We finish by talking about coaching and and basically how to become a master coach. Like I said, these are two of the best that I've ever met. And uh, part of it is because of their curiosity and their mindset in general about coaching. So this one's packed full of useful things, whether you're, you know, an up and coming uh, athlete, competitor, or a young coach wanting to develop. Enjoy the show. What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew, and this is the Brute Strength Podcast. I'm here with Pat Estes and Aaron Davis of Train Adapt Evolve. We're at CrossFit Jakarhu, and it's roughly as hot as the inside of a ball sack, but <laughs> we've got a little wind on us, as you can hear. Guys, um, first off, sorry I'm late for setting this thing up, but thanks for so much for making some time to do this. Yeah, no worries. No problem. It's good. So for everybody listening to this, I I came to know these guys um, after training or while training at CrossFit Jakarhu uh, leading up to regionals. And within within my first session with these guys, I noticed that there's you, you guys uh, approach the body and the and the and an athlete in a different way, in a very unique way, and you you look at athletes as an entire system rather than just looking at the body or just looking at one uh, joint. You look at the system, how it's uh, you know physiologically connected, and I, you know I think it's really interesting because I think a lot of coaches out there are you know they'll at best their assessment consists of maxes and PRs, and then they're not looking at the body as a whole. Um, even at Brute, we have a long way to go in that realm. So I think it's a it's a really interesting conversation that we can have. Um, I think you also have some really unique tools that you use that I think is are really going to be of interest to some athletes and coaches out there. So first off, I want to start with this idea of treating the athlete as a system. Have you guys always looked at, at at athletes that way and if not how did you come to uh or, or where did you kind of come from and what changed yeah i mean i would say starting out like every other coach it's it's all about performance metrics right it's the the one rms it's the the times on the track right it's uh, power outputs um and, and what happened at least from my perspective was is that i chased that a lot and I realized I was kind of underserving certain things. And then when I realized when I can look at everything as a whole, you could drive a lot of these performance outputs a lot better, and I can keep the athlete healthier for longer, right? Uh, what do you real quick? What do you mean by performance outputs? Well, just like anything. So, say whether it's in like CrossFit, right? Like um, it could be an open workout, right? Time based. It could be one RMs. Um, if it's like some of my sprinters, it could be like obviously the the times on the 100 meter dash Mm -hmm. or the 40 or it could just even be you know jump protocols um, using uh, either metrics on like velocity based stuff Um, but those are all things that are like the flashy stuff right right but I think the big thing is is like how can we see where the athlete is physiologically and then also emotionally and then tailor up programs that are best suited for their internal environment and then all of a sudden you start seeing both health and then also performance kind of climb at the same time. Or sometimes you'll see performance climb, but then health will start deteriorating. And now their performance window is only, you know, maybe a couple weeks. Where I want a performance window, especially if we look at CrossFit or even sprinting, you need them to be, that performance window to be open for, you know, maybe 10, 12, maybe even CrossFit if you think about it. The games are in when, August? Yep. I mean, from May to August, you're looking at a pretty big performance window. Right. Right? So. So. You said you used to look at purely performance yep. um, performance metrics. So what what changed for you? What was there an experience or a mentor or a course? Yeah. Uh, I would say um, 
I mean, I, I started at a CrossFit uh, gym here in Austin early on, and I just started seeing people's lifestyle, and they weren't matching up with um, all the work they were putting in the gym. And some of them would come down with certain issues, uh, health issues, and in my head I was like, there has to be a way I could screen this. Uh, do they need to be in here six days a week um, doing two-hour sessions or trying to get as much as they can in? And I think with um, my early, when I was 13, 14 years old, a coach used the Omega Wave machine um, that they now use to do athlete monitoring in professional sports. And in my head, I was like, "That's that will give me a tool to assess day-to-day um, kind of physiology or at least the readiness with all my athletes. And so that's kind of where I started gravitating to that. And that's really been a key piece to our you know, assessment process and our day-to-day with, with our athletes. And Pat, you're coming from more strength and conditioning background, like a collegiate strength and conditioning background. How did you, what was your kind of evolution to, to reach this point? Well, I would say it definitely start with my mentor, Todd Wright, who's now the head strength coach for the 76ers. And him and Logan Schwartz, when I was at Texas, did a great job of actually teaching us chain reaction biomechanics. And that's kind of where my evolution of the evaluation process started was just watching them watch people just walk through the door and being like, this person needs this, this person needs that. And really understanding the more that you learn about chain reaction biomechanics, the more you understand what a person, that individual needs. Um, And it's not just those, like we all started with, just doing those performance metrics. How much do you bench? How much do you squat? It's, oh, do you have hip internal rotation that you can use functionally, you know? How do you how do you move you know your body in three dimensional space? So it it kind of gravitated from this uh, oh, little wind there. It kind of gravitated from just doing this kind of three D movement screen to from the movement screen to okay, well, how does this person's structure affect their function? And that's where kind of we kind of me and Aaron use a little bit of uh, some PRI table orthopedic assessments and try to get a blueprint of where the athlete is, and then from there we'll do a three-dimensional movement screen and and kind of see what transfers over. So is what we're seeing on the table transferring to this athlete's function? Because structure dictates function. So I think uh, I got to give credit to Todd and and Logan Schwartz there and then just kind of taking different courses, like you said, and and just take a little piece here, take a little piece there and kind of make it your own. I'm going to translate the the southern accent he's saying chain reaction biomechanics <laughs> so i, I want to get into that a little more so w- my first day that i that i laid down on on y'all's table um you looked at my leg length you watched my gait uh you looked at a lot of things that uh, i rarely see especially a strength and conditioning coach look at right maybe maybe one of those variables in a chiropractor's office or physical therapy uh, office why, why are you guys looking at that? And do you see any um, kind of pushback from athletes, especially competitors, when you're, when you're looking at things like that? Well, can we say we probably do it to save our asses? I mean, just a little bit to understand, like, one, I mean, can we load the person? Or in, in this case with you guys, right? Like, is the, the loads we know you're going to experience, is the structure in a sound place where you can handle those loads, right? And then... <clears throat> If we really think about it, especially in CrossFit, joint position is going to dictate how much volume you can probably do. So people, usually when people get on the table now, we can pretty much tell you whether they're going to be able to handle high volume or not. Okay. Right? Uh, Just the way they feel, muscle tone, joint position. Because if we think about just doing reps after reps after reps, and they have really bad joint position, then chances are they're not going to be able to handle the training that they'll need to get to that next level. Right. Can you give a specific example of that? Like uh, a specific joint and and movement? I would would say probably the shoulders in CrossFit, right? If you have more of an anterior tilted uh, shoulder, a scapula is kind of rolling up on the backside of the the rib cage, uh, your overhead position is going to be sacrificed. And the one thing that CrossFit does, even though it is varied, pressing is very, very much pressing just kind of vertical mostly, Mm -hmm. right? And so you have to think about repeating that effort over and over certain muscles are going to get used to doing the job right so you're going to lose a little variability within that shoulder because it's like well we have to get really good at this because that's what we're doing all the time and so from our standpoint is especially with what pat does is how can we build variability to keep the the joint position uh able to use all the range that it needs right but then also be able to be really functional when it comes to crossfit 
What have been the biggest surprises for you guys as you move into this population, right? The functional fitness, competitive CrossFit space. What have been the biggest surprises versus, you know, other other populations that you've worked with? This is kind of what you and I were talking yeah. about yesterday. I think the, the biggest surprise is, is just kind of the lack of what we call like your movement sphere. You know what I mean? Like you have you have somebody come in and what I mean movement sphere is is your ability to move your body three dimensionally in space with just under gravity. You know what I mean? Like how well do you just move under gravity? Can you do a lunge? Can you do a body weight squat? You know, can you take your arms overneath your head? Like real simple stuff. And people come into the gym and they just don't have these prerequisites and, and they don't have a good foundation of movement yet. Right. We were talking yesterday about an athlete that has placed nationally in weightlifting, mm -hmm. right? And uh, yet you, you asked her, can you do a push up? And she said, of course I can do push ups. Yeah. And she got down and what happened? Yeah, she got down and she really couldn't do a push up effectively. Her shoulders drastically internally rotate. She loses core stability. She can't activate her glutes. She can't do all these basic fundamental things. And one of the simplest exercises, yet she's doing most complex movements that at least I know, which is snatches, cleans, you know, a ton of overhead positional stuff. And it's like, do you have the fundamentals down first before you want to go do all the complex movement? This is such a, an important topic in this community because the, the answer or the people's mentality, even a lot, of, a lot of coaches' mentality is it really doesn't matter as long as they're getting the work done, right? We'll take a muscle up, for instance. Like if they can get up to the top, it doesn't matter how they get up there. They're at least getting up there. But from your perspective, from a, a long-term development standpoint and a long-term like lo you know longevity standpoint what's going on like why do they need to be able to do these fundamental movements correctly yeah i mean i i think that uh, that example is great because i think you can get to the top being very specialized but how long can you stay at the top right i think most athletes want to stay at the top for a good long period of mm -hmm. time and I think for us, um, it's how can we extend that? And by extending that, that means there has to be these general principles or movements that I think that they need to um, you know, be, be, be proficient at. Yeah. I think one, uh, one strength coach that really kind of, uh, kind of affected me was when I went to go visit Jim Ratcliffe in Oregon. And he had you know, athletes that would be doing the same fundamental movements that they did as a freshman as a senior and until you showed that you had the prerequisites of movement he's not going to move you along and i kind of think that's kind of the same philosophy that me and aaron have it's like okay can you can you maintain core trunk trunk stability like on the ground you know what i mean can you yeah what what's a what's an example of an exercise like that, that like an all four you know an all four like kind of cat position you know what i mean and then can you extend your hip and turn on your glute you know when it's supposed to can you even take your pelvis from that anteriorly rotated position that we see every day to a more neutral position you know when you lift can you squat with a with a pelvis that's not going to go through a ton of different ranges of motion whether that be anterior or posterior can you can you move with a neutral pelvis can you maintain your trunk stability can you squat without your rib cage externally rotating okay and then we go down this huge rabbit hole of well if you can't squat you know without externally rotating your rib cage you know, then are you really turning on the muscles that you think you're turning on when you're when you're squatting? Everything. Oh, I'm going to do squats, so I'm going to turn on my glutes and my hamstrings. Well, your position is going to dictate that, and if you can't maintain position, then what are you really doing? You're going to consist, like Aaron was saying, you're going to consistently beat up those tissues. You know what I mean? And then for us, it all comes back to, for me, all this comes back to my number one job, especially as a collegiate strength coach, wasn't to get athletes better; it's to keep them healthy. And I think uh, we kind of lose sight of that, you know, in the CrossFit realm, if your team, if your team goes into the games and they're hurt, you know, you're not going to do very good. Right. So what's your number one job? That's to keep your athletes healthy. And I think if we, if we kind of focus on that and say, okay, what's going to be best for this athlete's long-term development? Okay. Well, we're probably going to need to, you know, be able to depress the scapula. We're going to need to be able to squat, you know, with a neutral position of our rib cage and our pelvis. You know, and if I do that, I know that my athlete's going to have a better chance of staying healthy throughout the, the season. Mm -hmm. And that's that's our main goal. Well, it's it's really interesting because in CrossFit, the, the training is the same as the sport. So in football, for instance, we were talking about football. You know, you have your weight, your stuff in the weight room, your strength and conditioning. But that's like 
five percent, if that, of the entire equation. More like one percent, right? With ninety nine percent being the on field practice. Um, so it, it it does. I think it makes it harder for for coaches to to put that all in perspective. Like they they treat it as they treat it like they're training football players, right? And they just they just constantly beat them up. I think and I think your example of Oregon, like Oregon is one of the best organizations in the enti- on the entire planet and yet these guys are are pounding the fundamentals so much. Um, same thing at LSU, right? We have guys that can do, uh, you know, they come in and they can back squat six, 700 pounds, but they can't do a proper body weight squat. So you have to back them off and they, they don't put a bar on their back again until they can do a proper body weight squat. So this is a really long conversation, uh, you know, what we're talking about. So I want to, I want to just get into some kind of actionable items that people can, can, you know, implement today. So I think there are kind of two different, two different uh, types of people. One, it's perfect scenario, right? What the, these are people that they hear this and they're going to do whatever you say, right? And those are the people that have, you know, the 120 year plan. They want to be able to run and jump and play for, you know, 50, 60, 70 more years. But they also realize that's the best for my competitive future as well. But then there's the other portion of the population that is going to hear this and they're, you know, they're not going to stop doing muscle ups. They're not going to stop doing snatches and that's okay. Right. We, we know that's going to happen. So first off, what's perfect case scenario? Like what, what can people implement today? And, and I'm talking about like, you know, I we, we want to make some generalizations because obviously, uh, everyone's going to be different, but what are, what are some things that you think most CrossFitters can implement today? And then what are some things that if they're going to continue doing those high level movements, those tech, very technical movements, what can they still do to, you know, minimize risk? Well, I think, uh, probably the first thing is we we're looking at, can we, not have an extended rib cage. Can we have a neutral pelvis, right? And I think PRI usually does that the best. So you can go on YouTube and look at uh, 9090 hip lift with some breathing. Um, so, and that's Postural Restoration, Restoration Institute. Institute, okay. Yep. Um, and then also probably uh, the all four belly lift yeah. uh, as well. And those things are just <clears throat> real fundamental um, movements that everybody can do two or three times a day. It doesn't take very long to do it all, right? And, and a lot of it is, can you feel <clears throat> internal obliques, right? Doing their job when you breathe and especially when you exhale, right? A lot of times people, when they, when they do these exercises when we first teach them, uh, they can't feel anything, right? And if we're thinking, especially in CrossFit, having weight on your shoulders, uh, we wanna make sure that the core is, is, a, is a good foundation. So I'd say like at the bare minimum, those are probably two exercises to definitely start with. Since these guys don't have an expert with them to make sure they're doing it correctly, are there any like common mistakes people make with those two exercises? Yeah, I think uh, it's when you start implementing the breathing. Right. So you might get into that kind of all four cat position and then as soon as you take a breath, you have to go through extension to take that breath. And, and then that should be a big red flag for you. If, if I can't get in this position and breathe in this position, which breathing is the most fundamental thing in life, then should I really be doing this? Right. You know? And so I think we see people get in certain positions and they hold their breath and, and they can't take a deep breath. I had a, a basketball kid yesterday that for the first time ever, he took like a diaphragmatic breath. He was like, wow, that felt really cool. Nice. You know? And, and I think that's kind of what it's all about is, is just can't, if you can't breathe in a position, you shouldn't be moving in that position. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that would probably be the first one. And guys, these are all going to be on the, on the, in the show notes at brutestrengthtraining.com slash podcast. Keep going. Maybe like, uh, from the physiological perspective, what, what do you see kind of CrossFit? Well, I would say the next step after probably just the basics, yeah. right? Is how can you then introduce variability, right? And that could be variability just in your warm up, right? Are you, ex- are you exploring different ranges of motion? I think uh, obviously gymnastics bodies have done a really good job of, of introducing that into CrossFit. <clears throat> but I think you can even take it even further too. A lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, even Pat does with uh, applied functional science, right? With the Gary Gray stuff is, um, it's, it's interesting and it's something that I think you can easily use for, for warm-ups or even cool-downs in CrossFit. 
Yeah, I think if you look at the body uh, from all three planes, sagittal, frontal, and transverse, CrossFit's dominated by the sagittal plane. Mm -hmm. So any opportunity that you get in, in your warm-up uh, to experience a different plane, frontal plane, transverse plane movements, all that's going to come back to give you more in the sagittal plane where you really want it. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing is, is that when, when we think about like uh, warm ups, a great example, you know, how many people come in, do the same warm up every single time. And the way that our body adapts is through frequency and force. So for me, as a college strength coach, I was like, oh, wow, my dynamic warm up is super important because that's going to give me a ton of repetitions with my athletes. So if, if you're a CrossFit coach and you're like, well, I really don't know how to fit this into programming, just start tweaking your dynamic warm up because that's going to give you a ton of frequency, a ton of variability and say, OK, in my warm up, how many different movements are in the sagittal plane? And then how many movements are in the frontal and transverse? And I guarantee you, most of the coaches, it's all sagittal plane based. Right. And and the more the more time that you spend laying down, you know, uh, stress through those same lines of connective tissue, the less variability your body has, and the higher chance for injury. Right. So the the more variability at the end of the day, get as much variability as you can in your warm up, and you're going to help your athletes long term. And I think you can also use that warm up definitely as a movement screen too. Right? So for us, when we do the eval process, a lot of the stuff we probably put in to our evaluation is the stuff that we'll repeat in warm-ups. Mm -hmm. That way us as coaches can kind of see, oh wow, they can't get into that left hip, or oh man, they're, they're struggling right now with overhead stuff. That gives us cues to what to work on. Right. I think one of the reasons that a lot of coaches in this community are, are hesitant to implement uh, multi-plane work is they think it has no correlation to the movements, right? It's too far away uh, from the movements that we're doing, but they don't they don't understand what you just said, that you're, you're just overstressing tissues by moving in the same exact plane over and over and over. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. So if we look at rotation at the lumbar spine, you know, you, there's, there's not much rotation there, let's say between three and five degrees, right? So I look at it as if I never rotate this athlete, you know what I mean, and take them through that three or five degrees, then if they lose one or two, it's like, and we're like, oh, well, you don't need a lot of rotation there, but you lost over 50% of your available rotation at your lumbar spine. Right. So then, you know, when, when you do a deadlift, when you do an overhead squats, and you slowly start losing that range of motion. We're talking to a guy who's had issues in his lumbar right. spine. You know, I'm sure you'd probably want to keep as much rotation as you possibly can. So when you kind of, when you really understand, you know, the way the spine works, you, you start to realize like, wow, I want to use all the available motion that it has. And it just goes back to your goal. What's my goal? Keep people healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, if I don't keep people healthy, they don't perform well. So I think, uh, does that does that kind of oh absolutely give you, give yeah you that's that's question? such a great point too i think um in, in nutrition and training there's thankfully there's more and more um uh, more and more focus on what we do now what we do today is going to have an effect on us 50 years down the line and thankfully a, a lot of like big time you know either podcasters or scientists are, are bringing it to, bringing it to the forefront of like we have to be focusing on on preparing ourselves for the future right now um, so I, I love it let's talk about the omega wave what is it how did you get into it and how are you using it yeah, well, the Mega Wave is uh, <clears throat> pretty much a Russian um, invention, and then uh, so you know it's good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then they actually use the that system in a, in essence to monitor astronauts in space, right? That's where like a lot of the research came from in the 1960s. Um, and somebody was really smart was all like, "Hey, this is probably going to be a nice uh, business and a company, right? To start monitoring elite athletes." They've compiled. I think over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, data points on professional athletes, actually all athletes from all different walks of life um, and around the world. And it gives you norms and it gives you pretty much all the, um, the metrics you might need from a central nervous standpoint, right? So we get to look at like a DC or very low frequency um, brain wave, uh, which gives us like neurological potential, right? Um, it also helps us out with understanding is the athlete going to be receptive to learning coordination to our cues if we see that dc potential low 
well, I think us as coaches, we've all seen it where we're, we're talking to an athlete and they're just not there. They're just not syncing up the cues or they're not syncing up the coordination very well. And it could be things that they've done every day prior, but that day was off. Well, this just gives us one aspect to, to look at to see, okay, we might need to maybe use plan B on paper mm -hmm. because the athlete can't do plan A, right? And then from other than the CNS, we also have like heart metrics, right? We get to look at obviously the HRV stuff that's, that's popular out um, right now, but we get to look at pretty much every metric of HRV um, from high frequency to low frequency, which is really nice. Especially that's heart rate variability <coughs> for those of yep. you who have not heard of that. Yeah, and then uh, probably the big thing for us since we use the team system is being able to look at these other, other fundamental systems like uh, what your breathing's looking like, right? How's the brain perceiving the effort when you breathe? Right. So is it hyper functioning? Is it hypo functioning? Right. Those are all things that are going to drive our intervention as well. Detox. So is the athlete hydrated? What's the athlete doing nutritionally? Right. And then also the hormonal uh, score as well on the CNS. And this kind of gives us that dashboard on the car. If something awry pops up, then Omega Wave usually tells us. And that's when we can dig deeper. Do we need to do a nutritional recall? Do we need to look at uh, improving somebody's uh, respiratory system, whether it might be posture or maybe it's a, uh, say maybe it's a respiratory muscle endurance issue, right? Which is kind of common in CrossFit. Or is the hormonal system off? We might need to do blood work to see how far are we pushing the athlete from a physiological standpoint. Right. What what uh, commonalities, if any, have you seen in CrossFit athletes by using this system? Uh, well, we know kind of what the good profile looks like, right? And then the 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 not so good profile is usually when uh, the respiratory system is either in a very extreme hyperfunction or hypofunctioning standpoint. That means they're either they're either going to panting, like right off the bat, too soon, right? Which some people could say that might be more of a stress reaction. Therefore, they're maybe not recovering day to day because they're always underneath a, a very low grade stress. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also say is that the the hormonal system uh, is usually low because I I think a little bit. To be really good, you have to tell your body that you don't feel pain and you don't feel stress, right? That's that's a characteristic that CrossFitters usually are really good at. Mm -hmm. The only problem is that when you detach from listening to the body, sometimes you don't you don't guide training the way you need to from an individual standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so it just gives us a, an outlook to say like, hey, some of these physiological systems are off and maybe we need to like do a plan B or another intervention to help them kind of reboot their performance. I think for me, the biggest thing it did, especially in the collegiate setting, is I would think that, okay, well, I'm putting this six week plan together. And when we're done, my athletes are going to be stronger, you know? And really, I was guessing. We've right. always been guessing. And this was the first time, you know, when I was at Maryland, Aaron was one of the first people I called. I was like, hey, I want to get a mega wave. I want to learn how you, how you help athletes with this thing. And it was amazing just to see how much I was forced to kind of change what my plan was based off the individual you know and if and if I saw an athlete came in that was super stressed it's like well what's my job my job is once again keep them healthy you know what I mean so if I know that they're not going to adapt to the training stress today then what am I really doing am I helping them or am I hurting them and and this just gives me you know a window and it also forces me to check myself like am I actually making people better or are they just kind of getting stronger and I'm just beating the shit out of them you know what I mean? Right. And at the end of the day, I want athletes to come in to our facility and get better every single day. Right. You know what I mean? And that might just be coming in and, and getting some recovery work in and maybe working on, you know, some very small, simplistic stuff. Or it might be coming in and we're going to kick your ass today because your body's ready for it. Mm -hmm. But it puts the onus back on the athlete. Right. Because one thing we see all the time is how many athletes we have come in and we test their omega wave and their metabolic reaction index is a one or a two. Yeah. That means they're starving themselves. And so I had, especially with like the high school athlete that comes in, oh, I want to get bigger. Well, are you even eating enough? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you're not eating enough, then what I do doesn't really matter. Has, yeah, no effect. Um, are there any differences that you see in this population than your high school athletes and your collegiate athletes? I think one you, you, you said was the respiratory distress. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> It's all just a different degree. I think mm -hmm. the with CrossFitters sometimes the really good ones have have very good heart characteristics or metrics, right? Like uh, I can say that pretty much all the guys that were on the the Carhu team this year, 
all their Omega waves look very similar. And all you guys also placed in the top 20 in regionals, right? Or uh, very well for our mm -hmm. region. Um, and so, and you have a, re you have like a resiliency, right? So in other words, you guys can handle, you know, kind of the, the day to day pounding, right? And then the heart's not going to be your, your limiter. And I, I think that that's usually a, a very strong asset that CrossFitters have or the good CrossFitters have. Um, and I think from an athlete standpoint, that might be different than the CrossFitters that usually CrossFitters have a very low central nervous system potential because you guys are kind of grinding all the time. You're right. not really going high output and then kind of like low output, high output, low output, which we see with the sprinters or whatever. And so um, with athletes, we really want to kind of drive up that CNS um, and neurological potential. We should see that sucker kind of climb because we want the athletes to be uh, very neurally driven. Mm -hmm. And I think with CrossFit, with the volume, it's really hard to do that. Right. So what are some ways other than reducing volume? I, actually, before I even say that, I'll say I think mine was actually really high, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So and one of the reasons for that <laughs> is my training this year was not even half of what it used to be. And I felt fresh every single day I went into the gym. I felt great for all the open workouts. Um, so I, I really, I felt phenomenal and I didn't, I never dreaded going to the gym. And in the past, I definitely did get a little overtrained from some of that volume. And, and so, you know, I, I'm understanding what you're saying. Yeah. You want to talk about uh, oxygen consumption and, and moxie and what you're seeing? Because I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, wait, before we go into that, yeah. what are some ways that people can, can raise that score, right? Raise their, yeah. their neural drive. I think if you just have parity in your work, right? So in other words... Uh, is one day really high intensity, right? Like could be from a cardiovascular standpoint or even from a, a central nervous standpoint, right? Even though everything we do is from a central nervous standpoint, but is it high outputs, right? Is it Olympic lifting? Is it like the max strength stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's coordinative stuff. The really short, short Metcons yeah. could be higher intensity. Yeah. And then on the next day, is it kind of a generally like, it could even be high volume, but is it a low stress, mm -hmm. right? I think if you have parity in your days, then that sets up the brain to recover. Right. And some days, and that's what's fun about the mega wave is we can kind of then look at and see, OK, does this person need to work out really hard twice a week or do they need to work out hard three times a week? Um, and do they do need to have like on the off days, how much low level activity do they need to recover those processes so we can do high intensity exercise again? Because mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, uh, high intensity is the big driver. So if you can put more intensity to your workouts, you're probably going to end up having good adaptation. Absolutely. Uh, and so I think the. The one thing you can do is, is one is like, can we go back to listening to the body and can you have parity in your work? It, it's so funny too, man, because 99.9% .9 of people listening to this, they're training for the open. And what is the open? It's a five to 15 minute workout once a week, but they're training three hours a day for this one, you know, very high intensity, uh, you know, Metcon. And they're, they're wondering why they're not able to have that, that real push that they see some other athletes have. I think it's a, an emotional and mental drain too, mm -hmm. right? They, they then become unemotional when it comes to the high intensity stuff. And then the body has to respond, come the open, the open's like, Hey, like think about how much mental stress is happening during that open for them, for that, that one workout and how much they're putting into it from an emotional standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you almost need to train that way, in essence, through this through the year. But to do that, you have to give yourself enough rest so you can come into that day and be more emotionally um, and mentally involved in the workout. I think Aaron does a good job always telling athletes, and this goes back to kind of what you were saying, like people are preparing for the Open, and that's how many days away? 300 some days? Nine months. Yeah, nine months. So right now, what are you doing to prepare yourself for the Open? You right. know what I mean? Like as a collegiate strength coach, you look at the national championship and you work your programming backwards from there because that's where you want to be. So how many people are saying, OK, I'm going to work on my lowest hanging fruit, my biggest weakness mm -hmm. now, you know, nine months out and let me improve that, you know, and Aaron always is telling athletes, let's find what your lowest hanging fruit is. And then we work on that and then we retest you and then we work on that. And if you're constantly working on your lowest hanging fruit, by the time that open comes around, you're going to be a, a way better athlete than you were last year. Right. It, it, it really just takes discipline and some humility, right? Because people want to continue doing the high, like the highly technical movements. They want to be the best in the gym every single day. And so it's very tempting to continue doing what you've always done. But luckily people are going to hear this 
you know, with about nine months left and they can do those things that we, you know, we started the conversation with, they can get their posture right first yeah. off, and then they can attack the, the season with, with the idea that, you know, we're going to ramp up the volume as we go along, um, and, and intelligently so that I peak for the open. Yeah. Yeah. What are, what are a couple things that you guys are doing now that, that you just started in the last couple of years that are having the biggest, uh, biggest effect on athletes um well i, I mean i know we're, we're probably sound like a bunch of tech guys but i i, I would say that like uh the moxie stuff was uh moxie monitors it's okay it, it just looks at oxygen saturation in the muscle right so i can put on different monitors all on different muscles workable muscles obviously um and we can see how the body is transporting and using oxygen right um what's interesting with that now is that if um along with the table assessment and then also doing the moxie assessment that we end up doing uh, for the team, uh, there is a specific trend that always pops up that shows me that, oh wow, they, these athletes have the ability to do really well in CrossFit. And, and just to keep it simple, it's like, can they desaturate oxygen down to the lowest level? And then can they reboot it back up very, very fast? So it's almost like repeated effort. So what, what, is, what, what the hell does that mean, Aaron? So that means this. So in other words, that means, so the test just in general that we use uh, could be on an Airdyne or a rower and they have the Moxie monitor on and you're gonna haul ass as fast mm -hmm. as you can till I see oxygen pretty much go bye-bye, you know, in the working muscle. And then I'm gonna have you rest, right? And then I'm gonna see how fast it takes for O2 in that muscle to go back up to baseline. And I'm gonna have you do it again, right? I'm also taking power output the whole time. Some of the best athletes, at least the ones that we've tested that are in the region, right, that, that go to this gym, they can all last and do that for an hour at a very, very high power output rate. Actually, most of it's above 80%. Uh, that usually means that they have a very good ability to repeat efforts, high intensity efforts. And we just got done talking how the open is a very short duration, you know, relative and high intensity. And so if they have that prerequisite, from an internal physiology side, that means they have the foundation to do CrossFit really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it allows us to screen out people that maybe have other issues. Maybe their respiratory system can't do the work. In other words, they can't breathe and actually bring in O2 to the working muscle very well. And then we can change breathing uh, characteristics or um, maybe they're- Such as, what, what, what does that look like? Changing uh, breathing characteristics. Well, again, we, we, we use a device. <laughs> uh, it's called the Spyro Tiger, and it allows us to alter. Um, well, it's just simple. It's just like it allows us to do the same things you do with the barbell. So in other words, if you want to improve coordination in an ollie lifting, right, you're going to do coordinative efforts with the barbell, right, skill work. You can do the same thing with your breathing with the Spyro Tiger. If it's max strength, effort type stuff right with the barbell you can do the same thing with the spire tiger i'm trying to improve um, forced expiration with with uh, the spire tiger and if it's endurance which i feel most uh crossfit athletes probably lack in the more muscular endurance ability of the respiratory system then we can train that and the great thing is we can train that without training in the other muscles right so the last thing crossfitters need is more muscular work right and so this is the way for us to do that without really um, affecting the change of what the coach is programming or anything else. It's just another layer. Right. Is, what, what's something else that y'all have implemented in the last couple of years? Uh, I think for, for me, it's just uh, looking at all these different systems that have a tremendous amount of success with athletes, which is, you know, the, the Gary Gray, AFS, Applied Functional Science, that's kind of my movement foundation. Uh, and then obviously looking at PRI and saying, hey, what, is, what does PRI do that's really good? You know what I mean? Postural Restoration Institute and, and what can I use from that and what fits into kind of uh, my fundamental principles right. and then let's look at DNS and what can I take from DNS what and is then, DNS uh, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization okay. and then what can I take from FRC functional range conditioning and how can I and then obviously I probably say the biggest thing that's really uh, me and Aaron have, have dove into is just kind of osteopathic medicine you know what I mean and what can I take from all just these dipping your toe in yeah, just dip. I want to dip my toe in everything because everybody, everybody gets results, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm, I want to know, well, why does this, why does this group get really good results with this population? Because mm -hmm. the more tools that we have in the toolbox, the more we're going to be able to help people, and that's what it comes down to. It's not being a, a master of uh, 
I'm never going to be a master at any of those. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I can promise you this. I remember when I was a younger strength coach and AFS was my foundation, I kept running into these roadblocks. And I didn't understand why. And I was like, man, I feel like there's something going on like in this area that I don't understand yet. And I mean, kind of selfishly, I don't want to run into roadblocks anymore. Right. You know, I, I kind of want to, I want to be able to, to look at somebody and say, okay, well, this is what's going on. I can use this tool to help this individual. So really it's, it's just, uh, me and Aaron kind of just sitting down and saying, okay, well, what do we see in this person and how can we make them better? Right. You know, and what, how many tools do we have? The more tools we have, the, almost the better it is, you know, and then kind of almost perfecting perfecting your craft around those kind of different buckets right um, well I think that's the that's what's hard in the fitness I, I would say even in the business uh, spectrum in the sense of that like most people uh, in the fitness performance side they, they have like a, a niche or they have like a guru type feel right um, and they're very kind of absolute in their ideas and say well no this will work I promise right but it's it's uh, it's seductive because when somebody has that kind of confidence in, mm-hmm. in one modality, you're like, this is this is going to work, right? Mm-hmm. But from our standpoint, we really want to look at it as like, you know what? There's no way we can put our hat on one thing. And each individual coming in, can we put our ego aside so that we can just look at the athlete like a blank canvas and say, hey, we have all these tools back here. We're not in love with any of them. You know, they don't rule us. And can we then transfer that back to what the athlete actually needs and it right. might it might sometimes go against their best judgment you know i mean me and him have talks all the time and 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 sometimes one tool that that he might be really good at you know we might need to have him to actually be with the athlete mm-hmm. and not me right and so it's it's really letting go and saying hey what is actually best for the athlete right what i notice in both of you is this uh such like curiosity which If you look at masters of anything, of any craft, that's what they have, right? Cultivated curiosity. Have you guys always felt this driven to learn more? And if not, what what changed? How did that evolve for you? Uh, I would I'd probably say it. The beginning of that was when I walked in University of Texas weight room for the first time. I think I had uh, I was really into kind of like Michael Boyle stuff, FMS, going to perform betters. Kind of I was on a very traditional track was about thinking about doing a GA, you know what I mean? And then I think I have this good kind of foundation that you would see in most, now I'm being very, this is typical kind of strength and conditioning, Yeah. you know, okay, I got my CSCS. You got all those kind of fundamental pieces, USAW. And then I walk in a weight room and I see people squatting in all different planes of motion. And I'm kind of like, well, what the hell is that? These people don't know how to squat, but really I didn't know shit. That was the problem, you know? (laughs) So really, I just never want to, walk into a situation and be like i completely don't understand this you know what i mean and i may not agree with why that person's doing it but if i can learn some of that then we can at least have an educated conversation Mm -hmm. so really just comes down to i want to be able to talk to anybody you know and us to have an intelligent conversation you know i feel like so many times people like well i'm a pri person so why am i going to talk to this person Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I got into PRI is because somebody else told me that it was all bullshit. So I was like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see what it's all about, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I think it's really come down to, um, I think early on, I just didn't want to be told what to do. And, uh, and so I wanted to find what are the base principles? How can I filter information coming in? Um, so I can like kind of put up the bullshit flag if I need to. Right. right? Because I think it's hard as a strength coach right now, the internet, especially like, it's uh, it can lure you in with a lot of information, but you can't filter it. So then you try everything, right? Which that approach works too. But I think if you actually um, can read research or, and, and study really good coaches that are very fundamentals and like principle based, I think that allows you to then open up, right? And uh, to accept new things and use new things. And so for me, that's really been um, the core idea for my studying is and all, everything I study is like, how can I find the base principles of each of these different, um, you know, I'd say categories in science or exercise or whatever else, and then mm-hmm. expand upon it, you know? What do you guys, what, what would you suggest for the young strength coach listening to this? You know, maybe they have an L1, uh, CrossFit L1, or they just got their CSCS, and they want to understand how the body works, how it develops, how to, you know, keep people safe and also perform better. Um, what, what would you suggest for them going forward in terms of education and, and just their mindset? 
I think the the book that really changed it for me was Anatomy Trains by Thomas Myers, and uh, it was funny. One of our interns was talking to us today, and and when I was at the University of Denver, I had seven different Olympic sports, and I was a I was a lacrosse player. So he was like, "Oh, well, you must have known all the lacrosse stuff." I was like, "Yeah, I felt more comfortable with lacrosse." But he was like, you, "Did you know anything about skiing?" I was like, "I didn't know anything about skiing." So I just went and watched him practice. But the common denominator was is that I got an, an appreciation for human movement. And if you understand human movement, then it doesn't matter what you're doing. It could be CrossFit, it could be skiing, it could be men's lacrosse, you know, or, or any athlete or the person walking in the door with back pain. Mm -hmm. But if you take the time to understand chain reaction biomechanics, I'll break that down for you. That's nice. And uh, just I think Thomas Myers does a good job of, of re, you know, breaking down how the body's a connected unit. You know what I mean? And having an appreciation for fascia and how fascia affects the body and from the proprioceptive standpoint, which then ties back into what Aaron does such a good job of is understanding the central nervous system. Um, and you're going to go, if you read that book, you're going to go down a rabbit hole pretty quick. Right. So I would also say too, is just find good coaches to learn from. I mean, right. I think in our journey, you could probably uh, list tons of coaches that we've been able to spend time with and, and to, to learn it. And I think it's, um, try not to find coaches that are hot right now try to find coaches that have stood the test of time right before the internet even mm -hmm. they're still out there i promise right uh and they're really willing to you know sit down and have a chat or even for you to come watch right um i think that's important is is flash will go and right. the, the same principles always stay and so finding a good coach that can walk you down that is is, is huge it's it's interesting that, uh, especially in the collegiate scene, I've, I've almost never heard of someone being turned down uh, when asked, when, when asking, hey, can I just come shadow you for a day, right? Coaches are so willing to let you spend some time with them and ask questions. It's, it's flattering for most people, right? And so uh, I, I wrote an email to our like newsletter subscribers a while back, like breaking down kind of the, what I, what I consider the, best forms of education and I said books are phenomenal and, and they're one of the best forms of education but if you can attend a very intensive course that's probably gonna you know trump a book and if you can spend time with someone that's that's gone through all of this they could potentially help you skip a lot of levels or, or a lot of mistakes that you would have made along the way yeah no totally agree and then uh, I think that's now like uh, the benefit of some of the, the younger coaches is that like I think they're kind of hip to, to a lot of that sometimes and like I can only imagine how many mistakes and mistakes I'm still making right um, and having good mentors man it'll it'll speed you up by 10 years it right seems like so what are some things just one or two things that you th see being commonly done today that is actually bullshit uh, well, early on, it was the breathing mask stuff. That was crazy. Um, How come? How so? Well, if you think about it, chances are they're probably taking in their own CO2, you know, with the, bre the breathing mask, which obviously is going to, um, you'll desaturate O2 in that internal environment a lot, but you won't be able to like reload O2. So it'll actually kind of push people either hypo or hyper uh, on the breathing. So it actually will mess up kind of like their homeostasis line or what the brain per is perceiving homeostasis. Um, that's if they're doing it like every day, which, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you, you still see that. Um, I you saw know, a guy riding a bicycle, like just, he might've been, he looked borderline homeless and he had a, he had a, one of the masks on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe I don't, Let's I have get no his training idea. in though. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that, and then I think if we look at the William Hoff stuff, I mean, like I get it from principle, um, but you're looking at what can actually affect some people might not be in the right, uh, physiolo physiology foundation for that stuff. It's like everybody comes in different. You might be hyper or hypo functioning. You might be normal functioning in the, in the breathing, right? Which then kind of leads you to different modalities. But I think we have to think of things as in what's right for the person and not just what's popular right now, mm -hmm. you know? And so anything you see that's popular, that's a cure-all, there is no such thing as a cure-all, you know? Right. So uh, I think it's the best coaches in the world usually cast a big net and they're not hung up on one thing. Right. Yeah, I would, I hate to be a broken record, but just not seeing enough of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. The most impressive thing I saw on Instagram recently, I'm not a big social media guy, 
But uh, every once in a while when I get on there, I was like, oh, wow, look at this athlete with really good squat film. Mm -hmm. That's cool to me. Not like all these fancy exercises that you can do and, you know, what's cool right now. It's like who knows how to coach the fundamentals really well, you know. That's what's that's what's impressive to me. So, um, once again, it's just don't look for the big fad. Just like Aaron said, look what stood the test of time. You know, some of the best coaches in the world are still doing the same stuff, and they're doing it for a reason. Um, so I, I would just look look to the fundamentals always. Love it, guys. If people want to work with you in Austin, what how can they go about doing so? Yeah, just uh, visit our website, Train It Up the Vault. It has all our contact info there, and then uh, yeah, we'll get you scheduled up. Awesome. And then if they want to work with you uh, online, do the same. Yep, same thing. Yep. Awesome. Anything else? Uh, where, where can they follow you on social media? Ooh, we're kind of social media ghosts, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Facebook, either Aaron Davis uh, or Patrick Estes. Um, we used to have an Instagram account, but uh, you know, to be honest, we're, they kicked y'all out. Yeah, we're kind of like Yoda. We want to be in the back of the cave where nobody knows where the hell we're at. So that's good business yeah. right there. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. I'll tell you this: if you're if you're a coach or you know you're you're getting up in this business, I'll tell you what: if you call us and you're like, "Hey, well, I want to come out and shout at you," hell yeah, come we'll yes. come watch us. We'll definitely say yes because because I know when I was you know an intern and, and getting up in this business, I would send four, five, six emails right. to to guys like. You know Bill Knowles, who's I think one of the best therapists in the country, um, and then just being really lucky to be around smart people like my mentors Todd Wright, Logan Schwartz, uh, chiropractor in Denver, Nick Studholm. I mean, the, I could I could go on and on and on all day of all these people who help mold me into into who I am today. So if if you write down a list of okay, who do I really need to thank for where I am right now, and if that list doesn't have at least ten people on it, then go find those 10 people you know what i mean absolutely man look them up guys hit them up come spend some time with them these guys are uh incredibly intelligent and doing great work thanks for making some time today guys this was awesome um show notes are going to be on brute strength training.com slash podcast and if you haven't already if you want you know fr some free resources ebooks the the top podcasts that we have out uh, sign up for the newsletter at brutestrengthtraining.com. Thanks. Thank you.